Hey everyone, welcome to JoJo's World. Good evening and a salutation from the south of the equator. Good morning, good evening, we all exist in a timeless void now inside our own homes. <laughs> I remember when I saw sunlight, I immediately drew the curtains. Oh my god, I was better off for it. No I'm, sunlight I'm... in my secret vault. I, is your secret vault a castle of some kind? This is our JoJo's Bizarre Adventure recap and discussion podcast, where today we are recapping and discussing the 16th episode of Jojo of Thus Spoke Shive Rohan at a confessional. I'm Liam S. Smith, one of your co-hosts. And I'm Nick Ballantyne, the other one of the co-hosts. Nick Ballantyne, the other one of the co-hosts. Tell me about Kishibe Rohan. Well, he's a mangaka. He's a guy who cars some manga, if you know what I'm saying. I sure do. He draws it, he lives it, he loves it. He's a man that you can trust. He's a man that I would never trust, but he's a guy <laughs> who has incredible stories and incredible times ahead of him. He's a man you can trust. He's a man you can't trust. No, he's a man I don't trust. He's a man who won't give you his nutrients. Exactly. He's the kind of guy that if you were like, do you want some of my nutrients? He would be like, yeah, sure. And then you were like, hey, can I borrow some nutrients? He'd be like, I refuse. What the fuck are you? What, what are you? Why are you come to my house? Nick. I'm just the humble mangaka. What did you think about this episode? I thought it was okay, but the problem is, relative to the last episode, which was... Episode four, The Run. Exactly. Compared to that, this one was a bit like, uh, yeah, okay, all right, we're at, we're at a confessional, I guess that's it's all right, it's okay, yeah. I guess we truly were at a confessional. Nick, shut up. Uh, I want to share with you <laughs> some words of wisdom from Hirohiko Araki, who composed Thus Spoke of Shibe Rohan, episode 16, at a confessional. Oh, I see. See, are you, are you saying he's the uh, he's some kind of author? Of I would go one step further, Nick. I would say he's some kind of auteur. Ah, the pretentious version of author. <laughs> <laughs> I know what that means. In 1997, the editorial team asked for a short story. The terms were less than 45 pages and no spin-off of an existing series. Ta-da! And here's a spin-off for you. <laughs> Good work, Araki. Good work. I obviously made a first draft without Rohan, but isn't that better if he's the narrator? Just read the panels without him, just to see. It's like a tasteless meal, isn't it? When I think about it, with the inter interdiction, I would never have drawn the other row. Oh, yes, I see what he's saying. With the interdiction, I would never have drawn the other Rohan spin-offs. I'm grateful for that. With the other Rohan spin-offs? You know, the other episodes of The Spoke Kashibe Rohan. Wait, so was, was this the first one? Sounds like it. Oh, why is it episode 16? Why not? We talked about that last time. Remember? <laughs> yeah, but uh, no, hang on. Okay, yeah, so I this, assumed, is, this is the first one. I assumed that episode was like the release order that it came out. No, you, you, you were wrong, Nick. There have not I'd... been 16 of these. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Never mind. As we talked about in our first little mini series on um, Thus Spoke Shibe Rohan, oh so long ago, um, the episodes are uh, Thus Spoke. In, in, in order of release, Thus Spoke mm -hmm. Kishibe Rohan, episode 16, at a confessional. Uh, that was today's episode. Thus Spoke Kishibe Rohan, episode 2, Mutsukabe Hill, aka The Ballad of Gurchep. Uh, uh, Rohan Kishibe Goes to Gucci. Mm -hmm. Thus Spoke Kishibe Rohan, episode 5, Millionaire Village, The Corn Cob Challenge. Mm -hmm. Thus Spoke Kishibe Rohan, episode 6, Poaching Seashore. I believe that's the one that features our friend Tonio. Oh, one day. One day I'll get to see <laughs> it and it'll be beautiful. Thus Spoke Kishibe Rohan, episode 4, The Harvest to Moon. Mm -hmm. Thus spoke Shibe Rohan, episode 7, A Rainy Monday. A Rainy Monday? Mm -hmm. A Rainy okay. Monday. Not to be confused with um, Thursday, July 15th, 1999. Oh, of course. Thus spoke Shibe Rohan, episode 8, Deoxyribonucleic Acid. Uh, oh, I get it because it's dioxyrib... That one. It's that one. Mm -hmm. I get it. I, I know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm with you. I'm with you. I, yep, yep. No, yes. Yes, no, yes. I don't know. Yes. Can you repeat the question? <laughs> You're not the boss of me now. Thus spoke Shibe Rohan, episode nine, The Run, finally. Hmm. Is that it? Yeah. Oh, so there definitely are not 16 of them. No. And yet, for some reason, they are entitled the first one as episode 16. You are right. But 
But why? Episode but two why? is episode two. Episode three is episode five. Episode four is episode six. Episode five is unnumbered. Oh my god. Yep. Okay. <laughs> sure. Uh, hey, Araki. Just hey, Nick. A quick, quick question, right? <laughs> quick question for your genius mind. Have you ever heard of a little site called Patreon? <laughs> Go on. Well, would you believe that some of the people on Patreon give us money, Whoa. and in exchange, we do crazy shit, like shout out their names on the show. Did you know? I didn't know. Tell me more. Well, today's shout out, Liam. I'm sorry, Araki. What am I? What am I doing? Come on, don't break character, Nick. Don't break character. Come on. Today's shout out goes to Lily Berwick. <gasps> Lily That's Berwick, right. Right. as I live her. and breathe. <laughs> That one old Lily. Lily Berwick, I presume. Ah, uh, yes, it is I, Lily Berwick. Do you reckon we could have an action spin-off of, instead of John Wick, Lily Berwick? You can call me Lily Berwick from the way I'm dropping Hamiltons. <laughs> <laughs> hey, let me uh, just grab a candle, because uh, my name's Lily Berwick. I don't know if that was a joke or not, but hey, I'm rolling with it. I'm rolling with it. Oh, let me just um, oh, take my foot out of my out of my cowboy boot. There's something sharp. Um, oh, ouch, ouch, ouch. Oh, oh, it's a Lily Burr wick. Ah, uh, guys, hang on. Let me just jump inside this pool of my own uh, self defeatism. Oh wait, I don't have to because I can see a Lily Burwick pad over there. That's... Hey, Nick. Yeah. Shut up. <laughs> That's right. I've unearthed secret new author's notes. <laughs> Thank you, Lily Berwick, and go on. <laughs> I've discovered the um, the author's notes for the two v- volumes of Thus Spoke Shibe Rohan that are, like, uh, the collections. Oh, uh, what? Oh, shit, yes. By Hirohika Araki. This is what he has to say in volume one. Maybe you know, but Rowan Kashibe, the protagonist of this volume, is a character from the JoJo's Bizarre Adventure series. In particular, uh, the fourth part, Diamond is Unbreakable. I'm sorry, the, the what? The what? A little huh? anime called JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. Nothing. Got nothing for it. I, he is, is a mangaka some... and a stand user able to transform someone into a book, thus accessing this person's life and thoughts, and also influentiate them by writing oh. among the lines... <laughs> Influentiate. Yep, a standard English word that we're all very familiar with. Well, that's the me of the episode. Influentiate. This collection gathers several stories about the adventures he had during his research. The first chapter was written in 1997. I'm very happy to see them together here. And then for some reason it switches from bold to italicised. These okay. five horrifying stories bring us to Italy, as well as the middle of the Japanese mountains and the beach. I hope with all my heart that you'll enjoy reading them. Hmm. With all my heart. Does Araki have, like, like legitimate question. He's unaging, right? So I'm just, I'm curious about the machinations of his body if he doesn't age. Well, you say that, but he's looking, heart? he's looking a little older in the, um, the photo that's accompanying these, uh. Oh. He's wearing a, um, sweater and one of those, like, cab driver hats. Have, oh, you mean not a fedora? No, but like, like a, a like a flat cap. Not like a beret. No, but like a newsboy cap. You know. Oh, yeah, I think I get you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he's he's just looking a little weary. Oh, it's probably from all that fucking JoJo's fan art. <laughs> it's probably from all that fucking JoJo's bizarre adventure he makes. <laughs> He just wakes up one morning, he's like, what have I done? Volume what? 2. Here is the second anthology that Rohan Kashibe, a mangaka and stand user who can turn people into book to read their lives and put new orders in them, is presenting. Mm, mm, yes, you never know, have that feeling when a sentence just gets away from you. <laughs> Look, I, I just feel like it's influentiated me a bit too much, you know? <laughs> This book is composed of several episodes that were initially published in different media. Now that I'm reading them again, I see that each episode has its now atmosphere, depending on where it was published. I think that's just a typo, I meant to say own. The, the, no, no, it has its now atmosphere. <laughs> For it instance, was written in the, the now. For instance, the Basetsu Margaret, or the smartphone app. Yet I wasn't conscious about it when I was drawing them. Rowan Kashube is such a lucky guy, isn't he? <laughs> He has so many friends. <laughs> Except that one man. That man. Nick, let's get into it. Okay. It's Mario. It's Mario. It's got to be late 2000 or early 2001 because they're all hanging out. And by they all, I mean Rohan at the Cafe de Mago. You remember that location from Jojo's Bizarre Adventure Part 4, Diamond yeah, yeah, is yeah. Unbreakable. The, yeah, the uh, the Cafe de Major from uh, Jojo's Bizarre Adventure Part 4, Diamond is Unbreakable. Yeah, yeah. The one that's not Tonio's, but they all hang out at. But which is also from Jojo's Bizarre Adventure Part 4, Diamond is Unbreakable. Yeah, or Diamond is not Crash if you're 
nasty. Ah, uh, or if you speak Japanese, some other title. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Presumably. <laughs> I hope so. So it's Rohan. He's there. He's like reading a book and Koichi is sitting at the same table. (laughs) I didn't even... When when we were like watching it, I noticed it was like, oh yeah, they're there having a good old conversation. Didn't even like click. Oh, Rohan's literally just fucking ghosting him while reading a book at this cafe. So this is Koichi... Shortly at before, his short, yeah, at his finest. Shortly before, um, Jojo's Bizarre Adventure Part Five: Golden Wind. Bento Aurea. Yep. He looks taller in this episode. Did you notice? Yeah. Is this because everything that happens in these Rohan Kashibe things looks vaguely more real or <laughs> Could grotesque? Be. Could be. Like, maybe, or maybe it's also. You remember how we talked about the episode with the lock, uh, Tama- Tamami Kobayashi, mm-hmm. uh, and we talked about how in the manga when he was first introduced reduced he was like a huge hulking jojo the bizarre adventure yeah. character and then he's slowly, slowly reduced to the tiny character we see him as in the anime yeah maybe much like that this is koichi's personal growth being reflected in his physicality i guess but in part five was he always just short yeah anyway yeah so yeah okay <laughs> koichi as seen through the symbolic eyes of an artist is t- is a tall man <laughs> <laughs> or that very specific artist on that one day in this one scene was like, no, he's tall now. And uh, do you do you recall what he looked like in the other OVA we've seen him in, where he had like this really puffy face? He hasn't quite reached that point yet. Oh, the one where it was like after his I think story, after Millionaire Village, I believe. Yeah, and he was, he was like, because like, he's am cause I coming around? If you recall, Rohan, Rohan is living with Koichi because he had to buy a mountain. Hmm. Mm, which is hilarious Mm -hmm. on so many levels. So this is well before that, but also well after the events of Jojo's Bizarre Adventure Part 4, Diamond is Unbreakable. Nick, this effectively torpedoes my theory that these all happen around the same period of time in Rohan's life, which means that whatever you were saying last week could be true. It's completely redundant. Oh, that you were were asserting that perhaps the run took place before he moved to Mario and was why he moved to Mario. Yeah, but it's, I don't know, it just feels like all these stories could happen whenever yeah right? I, that's the beauty of them really ah oh, and you never know except we, we do know, know this time answers. well that's true because Koichi's know. about to go to italy and <laughs> we rohan, know when that happens yeah and rohan very much is like yes we won't talk about that man yeah so yeah koichi's like rohan i need to ask you a favor uh, i'm going to italy soon can you make me able to speak italian and rohan uncharacteristically cold to koichi is like why should i <laughs> the hell would I do that, my favourite human being? Well, you see, it's my first time travelling and I'm a bit nervous. Also, I'm going to do a secret mission for a, an international <laughs> conspiracy organisation. You know, they're not spies. I'm not a spy, but... I'm not not a spy. <laughs> there was one word to describe me. It would not not be secret agent. Now, am I going to spy on a certain individual? Yes. <laughs> Am I going to go to a different country and watch that individual? Yes. Am I an international man of mystery? Yes. Would I be considered an assassin? Well, I never said that, but yes. I want to go to Italy. Can you help me? And Rohan's response is, let me tell you a story from a time I went to Italy. Which, wait, isn't this the bit with the, this man? Yes, yes. When I first met you, because of that man, and like, big hateful Josuke with his back to the camera looms in the background. (laughs) As he's like, flumping his hair just upwards and back so that it's got maximum poof coming out. When I first met you, because of that man, I had to take a hiatus. Now you might recall this is because... Josuke beat Rohan within an inch of his life for insulting his hair. Mm, mm. Wait, Josuke, Josuke beat Rowan? Yeah, savagely. I, th- <laughs> like, I thought Josuke burned down his house. No, no, this was the, this was well before that. Oh. This was when he had been turning um, Koichi into a book and stealing his pages. And then Josuke Nokiasu figured out something was amiss. And then Rohan was like, I know your weakness, Josuke. I'm going to make fun of your hair. And then he did. And Josuke got so angry that he couldn't read books and... Uh, Oh, talk him to shreds. That's right. I do remember this. So while he's recovering from that, Rohan took a, tra- a, a trip to Venice for eight days and he heard a terrifying story. Spooky. Yep. <laughs> it was pretty <laughs> spooky. 
This, just remember, this is his response to, hey, can you teach me some Italian? Can you can you give me the ability to speak Italian yeah. using your magic power? Listener, please hold that this is a response to that request in your mind for this whole bonkers story. So let me tell you a story. Because if you think about it, <laughs> this is basically Rohan being like, this is what Italy is like to Koichi. <laughs> It really kind of is, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. It's just it's just him being like, oh, I could teach you Italian, but let me just tell you a story about Italy. No, 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 I need the words. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I was there many, many years ago. Yeah, but w- what about Italian words? I, I, what? I was let in a Catholic the church. Story. They have these things called confessional booths there. Tell me more. <laughs> tell me more. Tell me more. Does it have a nice curtain? That one got away from me. You know when the sentence starts influentiating you and you just... <laughs> It just, it doesn't work anymore. It does not indeed. So uh, he, he tells us what a confessional booth is, uh, as Rohan is like secretly, illicitly taking photos of it in, in the visuals. Uh, he absolutely should not be doing that, but he does it anyway. It's a place in a Catholic church where it's it's a booth with two entrants that are linked by a, a small window. Uh, the priest goes in one and the confessor goes in the other. And, and they can't see each other and the confessor can privately confess their sins to the priest and then the priest will say, say 1500 Hail Marys. <laughs> Right? For a brief moment. For a brief moment, I thought you were going to be all like, and then the priest says, Zawoldo comes and checks up on you, <laughs> does some magic bullshit, and then you're uh, you're free. You're free to go. Oh, man. Yeah, no, I'm pretty sure the way it works in Rohan's mind is you go in, you say some shit, you leave, you're all good. <laughs> I mean, that's how some Catholic people treat it, you know? I know. Once you well, confess, I've... you're scot-free. What, what was the show where someone was like, oh, no, I'm not going to make it into heaven. Oh, no, it's going to be terrible. And then they learn about a confessional. It might have been The Simpsons. They learn about the confessional and then probably Homer goes in and he's like, so let me get this right. If I confess all my sins, I get to go to heaven. And the priest is like, I, I mean, technically, that's I guess that's how it works. He's like, right, here we go. Confesses all of his sins over the course of like three hours. Gets out of the booth. He's like... I'm in. I'm in heaven. This is great. Wonderful. Time to go do more sins. Exactly. <laughs> you know, it probably works that way, right? It's just that easy. It's just that easy. Nick, my next note, um, I've got two notes here. One is that humans believe they can keep secrets forever, but they can't. And when we cut, cut to like a, a Jesus and angels statue. <laughs> and the bigger the secret is, the more it consumes you inside. And then my next note is place of ancient wisdom. Yeah, the ancient confessional. Uh-huh. Um, the place of ancient wisdom. Yeah. What? I don't know. Um, probably talking about the church or something. I assume so. Yeah. So Rohan's like, it would be a good, authentic experience to go and do a confession. So he hops in, which is definitely not allowed, by the way. Is it not? You is that not what you do? No, you can't go into the confessional until like the priest goes in to oh, like hear when, your sin. Also, when he's, I don't when he's think... doing his office hours. Yeah, exactly. You can't just go in a confession and be like, I'm gonna have a sit. It's like, well, no. yeah, because I was wondering, like, do you have to wait until the priest? notices that the curtain is drawn and that could take some time. <laughs> the priest can't see that far ahead. It's just like, um, um, I'm here. So, oh, oh, you're here. Oh, okay. Yep. Right. Gotcha. Yeah. No, I, I swear. It's like, you're not allowed to... You can't just do it whenever. Yeah, you can't just walk in. I think you have to wait for some kind of special ceremony and then, like, the confessional is open and then it's like, oh. <laughs> we don't know anything about Catholicism. <laughs> look, look, all I know is there's some religious bullshit that happens that then makes them allowed to do it. So Rohan goes and hops in the confession booth and he's sitting there and he's like where's the priest and then someone he hears someone else coming in and he's like ah yes now will be a chance to confess the hmm what sins have I Rohan Kashibe committed <laughs> does he even go that far no I'm just putting words in his mouth ah uh, good times because the other man starts talking he says forgive me father for I've committed a terrible sin and Rohan's like oh no he's made a mistake he thinks that I'm the, the priest uh, and then we get like a, a shocked Rohan face and then immediately, but to tell you the truth, young Koichi, I felt kind of lucky. And the shocked face becomes like a sly grin. And he's like, this is going to be great for my manga. <laughs> He's so into it. He's like, well, um, tell tell me wh- where you are going. No, wait, tell me what happened. What's going on? What's what's going on in your life? Tell me more. It all started that day. And we transition to a story within a story. <gasps> oh, 
my favourite kind of story. <laughs> you see, I had a job where I worked for a corn producer as a warehouse assistant, and my job was to move all of the corn. Now, I'm no corn-moving genius, but wouldn't you think that all of that corn that's on, like, those wooden plats things, you would have a forklift somewhere, right? I don't know, maybe maybe not. It was, no, it, we're really it was, shenmuing it. It was 1980-ish. Forklifts have been around since, like, forever. But how expensive were they? Ah, true that. Also, he's 21 years old. He's working as a corn producer. He's never had a girlfriend. I assume he's working in Italy because of the content of the rest of the story. Yes. Don't know if Italy or Europe in general are big corn producers. Dude, they isn't, have to be Isn't that by nature the, um, the, the American continent's staple crop? Uh... Surely not. I mean, look, I only know three things about corn, right? One, corn chips, generally a Mexican thing. Uh, two, I know uh, corn cobs. I, <laughs> Go assume on. That, I assume they come from everywhere. And three, the corn pellet things that are derived from the second item, the corn cob. But Nick, what about the band corn? Do you know about them? Ooh, uh, hang on, I'm trying to think of a reference. Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, my like... search for European corn is just turning up a kind of moth called the European corn borer. What, a moth? Yeah. As in an Italian moth or like just a, a moth? A European that moth. The European Ooh. corn borer. Well, in, in that case, Italy must have huge quantities of corn to develop their own moth <laughs> that is called a corn borer. Like, you would not... Nick rants about naming. You would not name something a corn borer if you did not have enough corn to worry about a moth that ate corn, right? But Nick, counterpoint... Yeah. If you're in Europe, isn't everything by nature European? So calling it the European corn borer is redundant? No, because you would want to feel like, yeah, we're European. Bam, European corn borer. That's where we're from. Uh, That's where it's at. Pride in the EU. Exactly. That's why it's called Great Britain, not just Britain. Since its initial discovery in the Americas, the insect has spread into Canada and westward across the United States to the Rocky Mountains. Well, I spoke too soon. Just like ah but counterpoint nick the european corn borer was f- hey I- i'm liam reading this wikipedia article and maybe i'm the real european corn borer <laughs> <laughs> this, this started off as hey let's listen to about this moth and now it's become a real borer of a look it's influentiating okay first this is re- becoming first very reported in massachusetts in 1917 but was probably introduced from europe several years earlier i'm sorry massachusetts massachusetts yeah massachusetts Massachusetts. Massachusetts. What are you saying? Massachusetts. You don't say sets, you say sis. But it's got a double T in it. Yeah, and that's why it's a dumb name, because they just say Massachusetts. I don't know if that's right. Any American will prove me right. I am almost certain. Well, everyone's always on my side on Twitter. So I am also right because I'm saying it how it's written. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but if you were to say it how it's written, subtle would be very different. Or um, any English location. <laughs> Any Australian words would just be like, oh yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty all right. Except a few that you'd be like, is that, is that how we pronounce that? Is that? No. So I was working as a corn mover. I was a European corn mover. And I was bored. He has the hair of a rake. Yes. And not a rake like a, um, like a disreputable person, though he is indeed that. Um, Mm. But he's got the hair like a rake that Sideshow Bob would step on and hit his face. And he would just go, no. Um, no, this is his hair is literally like sticking up and then prongs yeah, down. Yeah, three prongs, like uh, like the claw from Skyrim that was used in that puzzle. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, so he's working as a corn mover, and then that man appeared. <laughs> Not that man not that Rohan Josuke. Kishibe speaks of, but this It's one... not Josuke, it's time travel past Josuke. <laughs> um, there's this homeless man who yeah. arrives. And and from this homeless man's arrival, we immediately get the sense that um, the unnamed confessor is a terrible person. Yep. Because so... he's like, look at that man's like dishevelled dishevelled uh hair and, and listless gaze and, and his dishevelled clothing. Look at his poor attire and strange gait. It's obvious to me he's lazy. Of course. I did not take my eyes off my lunch the whole time. So 
He said it's 6 p.m. and he's working late, but he's yet to have lunch. This guy needs to join a union. Yeah, I know. Well, I mean, this was back in the 80s, man. They didn't have unions. <laughs> yeah. this, oh, it was a dark time. So his his entire, the entire discourse boils down to, hey, help me, I need food. And then the corn mover just goes, fuck off. Yeah. You gotta work for food. Here I am like, working overtime and this bum probably gets to sleep in parks all day. And it's just like, dude, what, what is wrong this with you? This desperate man who clearly hasn't eaten eaten in a week and says as much. Yeah, and uh, of course, the response is just, hey, how about you try doing some work and then maybe I'll give you some food. And the guy's like, oh yeah, I'm happy to work. Can I just, I haven't eaten in such so long. Can I eat first and then I'll work? No, because payment's given out after work. This guy sucks. I this guy's so the much. worst. He is the fucking worst. <laughs> like, at what level? A guy literally desperately comes up to you. You have food available. And it's just like, nah, you, got, you, gotta, you gotta pay for it, mm. buddy, okay? Do the- my job for me. The guy seems like, you know, a little optimistic at the at the initial mention of maybe getting a job out of this. Mm. Well, I mean, he's happy to work, right? It's the uh, it's the paradox of job getting, where you say you're happy to work, but if you aren't already working, can afford the right things to get the job. Well, you can't work if you don't have the right clothing or the right attitude, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, he's infected you. <laughs> Look, I'm just saying maybe they should learn the uh, the importance of the economy and their place in it. So the beggar, um, we're going to call these guys the beggar and for now the corn producer because um, we don't have names, no names in this story. Oh yeah, you're right, there are no names. Well, it's, a, it's an anonymous confession, isn't it? I guess it is, yeah, true. Mm-hmm. We um, know the, their faces, but that's The it. beggar um, like forlornly grabs a big heavy sack of corn and the guy's like, hey, why are you grabbing the smallest sack? You must grab the heavy sack and do hard work. Now, I want to leave in an hour, so chop chop. Hey, why are you using your arms like some lazy git? Come on, use your teeth. <laughs> lift with your back. <laughs> it's like, but I can't grab it with my back. I said lift with your back. And then he says, this shows that you're used to doing nothing. <laughs> and it's just like, dude, dude, what is wrong with you? As the guy is like, help me. And and the, the corn producer is sitting down and eating his sandwich. Just watching, being like, I'm not letting this guy have my fucking sandwich. Yeah. The beggar makes a desperate face and then we see he's collapsed under the heavy sack of corn. And the guy's all like, uh, hang on a minute. He's, Don't uh, pretend you fell. You haven't even worked for 10 minutes. He's, he just he just keeps berating him more and more. And then he hears then, a sinister voice. You thought I was wandering, did you? Yeah, I don't really know what he was meant to be saying there. There were a few times in this episode where uh, the it translation just, was not quite 100%. It must just be something like, you thought I was slacking off. Yeah, or, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we see a grotesque hand. Mm-hmm. And a devilish like, face. Uh, grab onto the dude's ankle and just yank on him. And then we see literally like an old school... Japanese demon head. Yeah, so it's the devil's face, but now he's got like sharp teeth and bloodshot red eyes and Yeah. Uh and he just looks fucking terrifying. <laughs> and he's all like, I have sunk into a sea of despair because of you. I shall never forget your face. And you dude- will pay. I will return in your moment of greatest happiness and come for you. And the uh, the corn mover, original corn mover, mm-hmm. is all like, "Well, that that's unnerving. He couldn't actually. <laughs> he couldn't. He couldn't. Right? Nah. Nah. He's. Nah. He like freaks out and falls backwards. And then then the other guys who were apparently there this whole time. <laughs> The other Who corn movers. Also assist. Yeah. yeah. They come along and they're like, oh my god, a dead body. And the guy immediately goes, shit. And, and we're like he zooming can't. in on his worried face and there's like a c- cacophony of church bells ringing, which was pretty cool. ding I liked that a lot. Oh, it's so good. And so back, then. Back in the confessional. I was truly, deeply worried for my own safety, but. <laughs> Things got pretty okay. I had no idea he hadn't eaten in a week, he says. And Ryan's like, wait, you spoke to him after he died? Are you sure you weren't dreaming? No, because that wasn't even the weirdest part of the story. The scariest part is yet to come. (laughs) (laughs) For a while, lots of good things happened to me. I inherited the fortune of a distant relative and I won the soccer lottery. Now, the soccer lottery. The soccer lottery. Have you ever heard? Or as an Italian would say, the football lottery. Mm, is that a thing? I don't know. Can can you 
check? Because if it is, I want to get up on it. He can't just be talking about like, oh, I made some bets on the football because it's specifically the soccer lottery. The Australian Soccer Pools was a national lotto type game administered by S South Australian lotteries. Rather than being drawn at random, the winning numbers were selected based on the results of association football matches. Maybe it's something like that. What the hell? That's amazing. The Soccer Lottery. The Soccer Lottery. He won it. Incredible. Man, what a guy. <laughs> He bought big land and like, uh, I think he took over the corn company or something because he's, uh, he's making sweets and cereals and selling them worldwide. Mm, so using his massive corn empire, he then <laughs> buys a big house. Marries a former model from the Milano yep. collection. Uh, he has servants and maids, cars. But he never forgot the words of that beggar. And we see him in front of his cars and servants looking slightly worried. And he's just there being like, hmm. Look, I've got to say, if this guy kept his same attitude from when he was a corn assistant, he'd be a terrible man to be a maid or servant for. Mm. I think it's safe to say he probably did, though. Not yeah. Get to that he later. sucks. He just sucks. He's the fucking worst. <laughs> So a man who has not aged at all, the corn producer, uh, is there with uh, in, in like a town square with a butler-looking man and uh, and his daughter. Uh, yeah. So rake man. The rake. The rake. So the rake, right? He he's all like, I'm so happy. I'm so genuinely happy. Look at my lovely daughter. Look how she's she lovely. catches the popcorn in her mouth. Oh, she misses. Oh. She's useless, but I love her so. <laughs> Um, and the daughter's all like, hey, dad, check this out. Bob, I missed. And then the dad's all like, you, you're useless. You're useless. For Look, just a moment, gotta... just a, the merest of moments, I thought, I'm so happy. And then we see in his eyes the reflection of a big hand lunging at him. How terrifying. How spookums. It's the daughter's hand. Oh. And she's all possessed. Uh, and on her tongue comes out a big face. The countenance of the big demon boy who was all like, in your moment of greatest happiness. Happiness, I'll come back and fuck you up. And I Look, did. He's doing it. See, yeah. that's a man who's true to his word. And the the um the servant looking guy is like, well, this all seems very unnecessary. And the daughter elbows him in the face real hard. He gets knocked out. Mm -hmm. Daughter is all like, ha ha. I'm possessed. And yeah, then and begins the end game. The rake is like, this is all very unwarranted. And and the beggar is like, unjustified. How dare you? Do you, I'll... you've been enjoying such good fortune. Do you think that was your own doing? No, I use my ghost powers to help you from the shadows. For you see, twas only so that I could build you up so that when I pushed you into this abyss of despair, it would be all the further fall. Man, this Sucks. <laughs> uh, I Becca just wanted says, an empire. <laughs> Beggar says, to save my own soul, I must resolve my grudges. I don't think that's quite how that works. Uh, I mean, it could in this unit. We know ghosts are real. And I guess he's like a big demon, so... But I am a generous demon ghost. I don't want you to die thinking it's all an unjustified turn of events. So I shall give you a chance. And he, he keeps using this one phrase, which I... I it's, it's grammatical English, but, but I feel like uh, is another... You like can't quite get past it? Odd translation thing. He keeps talking <laughs> about his, his rancor being unwarranted. Mm. Which, to be fair, great usage of the word rancor. Of course, Jabba the Hutt's rancor was unwarranted when uh, he fed that Twi'lek dancer to it. Oh, I thought you meant it was unwarranted in the sense that he didn't have warranty on it when Luke fucked it up. <laughs> so he was really angry because it's like, oh, I should have bought warranty on that useless rancor. Well, of course, famously, it's like the Beast Keeper who cries because he loves his horrible monster. Mm, mm. I mean, don't we all love our horrible monsters? That's true. Uh, real monsters. Oh. <laughs> Yep, so um, this guy, he's benevolent. He's going to play a fun popcorn game. Which makes zero sense to me. But this, hey, has, this has big part four energy. Huge part four energy. The mundanity is off the damn chain. So what the game is, is when the little girl ghost claps his hands... Uh, the mm -hmm. man, the rake, must throw the popcorn into the sky. The piece of popped corn that, of course, his daughter was playing with before. Part of his massive corn empire's uh, subsidiaries. <laughs> yep. Uh, and he must throw it higher than the top of the nearby light post and then catch it in his mouth. And he can do that. If he does that three times in a row, then he'll survive because the beggar will accept that it was his destiny to die. 
Hmm. Okay. Yep. Yep. How's where's the correlation between these things, like popcorn contest and the benediction from a curse? Why, Nick? It was only by moving popcorn or corn that the beggar died. Oh. So <laughs> the rake must show off his corn moving prowess. <laughs> Again, uh, no, no. Th- it, the idea is that it's a, a seemingly impossible task, and so if uh, if he's able to complete it, then then uh, destiny will decree that he should survive. <laughs> I and, guess. And the beggar will be like, well, I am a sleeping slave to fate. <laughs> I don't know if this is poetic at all, but, you know, <laughs> it, it'll be justice, I guess. If you don't throw it for me when I clap, I'll kill you. And he, she claps and he throws it and he's like, good height. How did this happen to me? Uh, so as corn starts coming down, he opens up his mouth. He's like, OK, all I need to do is catch it in my mouth. This will be easy. Not a problem. The sun's glaring into my fucking eyes. Oh, no. I- and then he he almost doesn't catch it, but then he does catch it because he uses his tongue. Ah. Much like how the beggar is using his daughter's tongue. Mm. <laughs> it's really... Like, her eyes are just blank and it's the tongue talking the whole time. And her hair is standing up all ghost style. Yeah, it's like one of those things where when you like lean back in your chair and take a quick breath and you go, Man, this shit is weird. <laughs> like... You know, it's like when you're, if you're playing like Final Fantasy or something and you mm-hmm. like lean back for a second, you're like, yeah, this is getting weird. This is, this is really a weird. Bizarre adventure. It really is. Okay, I want more. T- time for throw two. But the sun's in my eyes. Can we do it in the shade? No. Do you think the, you get a choice? The time is now and the place is this. Man, what better time than now? What better place than here? Oh, yeah. Can't stop it now. He gets all resolute and he throws it up into the air and he's like, yes, the sun hid behind the clouds. I truly am a lucky boy. Fate is on my side. Oh no, pigeons. Are they pigeons or are they white doves? Well, I want to say they're pigeons. I want to say they're doves because the symbolism of doves are something, right? Ugh, I guess. Peace was it, was it or you, whatever. Was it you I was having a massive talk about the uh, the distinction between pigeon and white dove? No. I, I can't remember. It was one of my friends. We went on Friday because I was like, oh, look at that pigeon and then they went oh no that's uh that's that's actually a dove like they're known to be doves i was like fuck off it's a pigeon yeah, and then we aren't, looked it up. Aren't doves just different coloured pigeons? They are. And I just went, so it's a pigeon. They were like, no, it's a dove. I was like, but it says it's a pigeon. It's like, yeah, because um, a pigeon is a dove. And I was like, all, all what doves are pigeons, but not all pigeons are doves. Hashtag not all doves, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're just there like, Nick, hashtag did, dove actually. <laughs> dove actually. It will be but a moment. Oh, oh. Wait, that's a duck. <laughs> hashtag goose actually. <laughs> hashtag goose <laughs> Could you imagine an entire movie that is love actually, except all the characters are birds? What I like imagining more, what I like imagining more is um like the the sitcom B plot that's been worked into, and you occasionally cut to the people trying to film it and on the set, and it's like, yeah, yeah, the geese are not behaving. It's sort of like a mockumentary about trying to make Dove actually. Mm-hmm. And they're just there like, so we got we got Rowan Atkinson's character, you know, the guy at the desk. Uh, we thought it'd be funny if we made him a... Uh, Ostrich. But the problem was when we were filming, uh, it, it seems to crave human flesh. Uh, so we had a bit of difficulty with him and then it just hard cuts to like the zookeeper being like, down, get down. And then hard cuts back to the interview like, shoot yeah, her, shoot yeah, her. We, 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 lost, we lost three crew members that day. But you know what we got? We got it done. That's the important thing. We got that 12 second shot. <laughs> And really, if if we didn't get it done, I'd be way less happy with it. And then it just cuts to a producer. What? No, we cut it out of the film. That's... What? No. Why did we need to get that done? What an idiot. So the sky is full of doves. Mm. The doves Uh, are hungry for delicious popcorn. They start swooping down and this guy's getting real concerned. He must act fast and act fast he does. He tears the popcorn bag asunder. Popped corn goes everywhere, diverting the doves from their, their fateful trajectory. Why have one popped corn when you can have all the popped corn? Have all the popped corn in the world. So he smashes it out. All the doves fly down to the ground and he, not even like any problems here, he just catches that little popped corn into his mouth. Mm, Tasty morsel. Mm -mm. Savory, but also salty. Mm, That's still savory, but okay. Yes, I know. I realised after I said that. (laughs) Just, you walk into like a candy shop. Ooh, all of this is so sweet, yet candy. Yet sugary. I wish there was some 
other delectable flavor that they could be, like a uh, like a uh, like tart or something. Mm. Mm. Willy Wonka just shakes his head. He's like, "Have I taught you children nothing?" <laughs> okay. Yep. That's all I got. That's all I got from this. <laughs> this is such a weird episode. Like, yeah. Um, okay. <sighs> Time for popcorn number three, the fateful third popcorn that will decide his fate. Um, big clap. Boom. But but not big clap yet because first he looks around and realizes the folly of his popcorn two strat for having spread all the popcorn upon the ground he has attracted even more doves and they <sighs> sit like the doves like the the gulls from alfred hitchcock's the birds on it's, every available surface it's like the cover of a mersbo album which is a reference that two people will get i know about- mersbo but i don't know any mersbo album covers i think about what eight thousand people will now go online look up a mersbo album cover which i would highly recommend the album cover as i scroll through my music library attempting to buy time not knowing if this joke is gonna pay off or not uh m e e comes after a i still know my alphabet He's i'd like recommend industrial noise uh he is garbage music um <laughs> So what do you have his... a, why do you have it on your phone then, Nick? Uh, because he has the Japanese birds collection, which is incredible. Uh, and it's literally like, he self-describes it as garbage music. But if you look up Japanese birds part 04, Karasu, you will see the crows. <laughs> uh, you can also get uh, Kuja Kubato, which I believe is pigeons or pigeon walk or something like that. Uh, that that's a good one. That's... I thought pigeon was Hattori. Which one's Hattori? I'm sure he's done. I've got no, I've got Hiodori. The name of the word for the bird, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm pretty sure. Oh, maybe this is like a peacock. Maybe a Kujakubato is a peacock. I can tell you right now, Kamo is probably duck because there's a lot of ducks on that album cover. Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of Mersbo. Maybe like I'm it. mistaken, and I'm just thinking of um, something from Neo, <laughs> something from One Piece, the pigeon named Hattori. Ah, uh, I don't know. Well, actually, it looks like the um, <laughs> quite a diversion here. Heartful boyfriend. <laughs> The yes! bird dating sim. <laughs> yes! I recommended that to a, a lady that I was going to go on a date with. Ooh. And then she she literally... It never happened because she was like, I just can't get on board with Western music. And I went, what kind of statement is that? What? And then for three days started messaging and then went, yeah, no. Uh, but I recommended she try any video games and said, you know, Houseful Boyfriend is pretty funny. You could try that. Like, it's pretty easy because you just get to read stuff. And she went, oh, I'll give it a look. And the very next day went, what the f- fuck <laughs> what, what the fuck is wrong with you maybe went, not a good what? entry level visual novel <laughs> yeah but it was just i went yeah it's like you know those visual novels she's like no not at all it's like you know romance novels i'm like yeah but it's about fucking pigeons i'm like yeah sometimes literally i was like what the fuck what you should have God, done with um daddy dating simulator or whatever it's uh, called well it, that hadn't been released yet <sighs> okay so anyway. the japanese word hatafuru means heartful because it's one of those phonetic pronunciation things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it's also phonetically identical to Japanese or to Japanese pronunciation of the English word hurtful. Oh. And the word hato means pigeon or dove. Huh. We hato. got there. We brought it we back. We got there in the end. <laughs> Guys, none of the Japanese bird collection from Mersbo is about a dove. And none of pigeon. it is about the spoke Kashibe Rohan. Which, by the way, is going off because all these fucking dove pigeon birds are here. He tries to scare them away, but they will not be scared. Scared. They want that single kernel of popped corn. They are eyeing him down and they're like, go on, throw the corn, corn master. Clap. Corn master throws the corn and the pigeons take flight, but they do not seize upon the corn because we see, at first we think it's like an anime style abstraction. The popped corn is engulfed in flame. But then we look down and we see that, no, the two It's ma- literally on fire. Yeah, because... Okay, so the man is holding a cigarette lighter in one hand, Mm -hmm. and both his hands are on fire. Yes. How did that happen? What what do you mean? He's got a cigarette lighter in one hand, and both his hands are on fire. Yep. I don't understand what your problem is. (laughs) So I can understand him setting one hand on fire in the the need to light this popcorn up real quick. Look, man's true folly was understanding... No, man's true folly was believing that they understood the nature of fire, Liam. And this is just another piece of evidence showing that we have no idea. So I may as well set them both on fire. (laughs) 
Look, I have an aesthetic here, and it's perfect mirror shape, okay? Both and he's fire. screaming. The birds will not get the flaming popcorn, but he intends to. Perhaps intending to rely on his inherent human saliva to put the popcorn out. <laughs> uh, meanwhile, as we know, birds do not salivate, so they can't put it out. Sure. Yeah. Is that a fact? Is that science? I don't know. I just made it <laughs> okay. up, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's a thing. They, I think they can vomit, but they can't I'm gonna salivate. I'm going to check the right? math on that. Anyway, yeah. uh, but he's going to catch it. He's going to catch it. But then the sun emerges from the clouds and he can't see it. The fire is blending in with the sunlight, which means that he can't see it. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, I want to try that now, but I'm scared of looking into the yeah, sun. Myth, Mythbusters, can we get you to do the popcorn fire sunlight check for us? <laughs> it's just one of those things that's like, I guess I've never set popcorn on fire or thrown it into the sun. So I actually <laughs> don't know if this is possible or not, but hey, let's do it. And there's a, there's a neat effect here where like the whole scene is obscured by the light representing how he can't see what he needs to see. Uh, and then he looks down and the flaming bit of popcorn is on his shoulder and then his head is cut off. <gasps> what? But, but that means he died. And the beggar is like, my rancor was justified. And then he ascends to heaven. He has ascended further into the sky. N- now, Nick... To, to, to make this, um, to, to circle back to the Catholicism of it all. Yes. Is one accountable for the sins one commits when they're a vengeful ghost or only for them committed in life? Only when committed in life. Okay. Otherwise, almost all of Catholicism would be fucked. <laughs> sure, okay. Jesus' ghost was famously very vengeful. <laughs> hey guys, I, uh, I heard you killed me. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> say goodbye to the Holy Roman Empire. So back in the confessional, the man is like... But I'm still alive. That's probably what you're thinking. Well, I came to confess because of my terrible sin. And Rohan's like, what? It wasn't that your terrible sin? Isn't now at, th- at this point, I was thinking perhaps, um, perhaps that uh, he would need to confess this sin to um, get over the fact that he killed this man mm. and, and ascend to heaven. And I thought perhaps, perhaps Rohan would would rush out and look in the other booth and it would be empty or something like that. Mm. But that is not what happened because no. he was like, the man made me so well and I could get what I wanted and I was wealthy enough that I could get a servant to do whatever I asked whatever I asked whatever I asked sex things dirty things like saying hello can you imagine that and we hear we start to hear another voice outside being like master come come out here soon please Rohan is naturally curious and draws back the veil slowly. And, and we hear sing. another voice. No matter how many times you confess, my rancor will not go away. And as he draws back the curtain, we see the chopped off head guy, aka Rake Face. Yep, the Rake. And he's there. He's there being all like, Master, Master. And then the man we thought was a butler or something who looks like um one of the Thompsons from Tintin. <laughs> He really fucking does. <laughs> he, he's he's revealed to be the true corn assistant. Uh, and he's like, I had all this money and I got this servant and I made him get plastic surgery to look just like what I did in 1980 or whatever it was. Mm, which meant that the ghost got confused and killed him, not me. Which to me makes no sense. But hey, <laughs> it's JoJo's baby. I regret it so much if now. If only I could turn back time and give that poor guy some food. There was so much corn just lying around. <laughs> uh, and the, serv- the true servant's ghost on the ground is like... Um, in your daughter's moment of greatest happiness, I will come for you. Yep. Yep. Also, the beggar's ghost is still also there being like, <laughs> hey, I'm also still here. Going to so- watch you 24 hours a day so you can't do any more tricks. And uh, the guy is like, hmm, well, I guess I just have to keep living my life and fucking walks out of the church. Just, just and like the two that. crawling ghosts go with him. And Rohan's like, huh. I guess I truly was out of confession. Hard cut back to Mario as Okiyasu's like, Whoa! Spooky as hell! (laughs) And Rohan's like, Okiyasu, why are you here? Why the hell are you here? Rohan was so wrapped up in telling his story, he didn't even hear Okiyasu and Yukako arrive. (laughs) And uh, they're both there, sitting (laughs) on opposite sides of the table. Uh... And Okiyasu's like, oh, did that really happen though? Did that actually happen, Rohan? Do you really add a confessional and hear about a guy who got beheaded but wasn't him and it was actually his servant because he made some wrathful spirit come after him? Hey, can I get some tea over here, please? (laughs) 
So good. Yakuyasu looks like he's doing well. Yeah, it looks like he still hasn't graduated. No, oh, that's true. He is in his school um, uniform still. Koichi yeah. is a high schooler now. Yeah. I mean, it's still very strange, but you know. <laughs> Mind you, I suppose Yukako was in her uniform too, wasn't she? I guess so. I, I think. don't know. It did. All of their costumes just <laughs> seem to be school uniforms. <laughs> and they also do seem to be costumes. <laughs> They really have self-identified with bling. You calling me a liar, Akiyasu? Oh no, but just like, what if he was maybe a confused stand user? Maybe he saw this guy and he thought, ah, oh, he could be a ghost, but really it was just a stand. Maybe it was like a cheap trick situation. <laughs> yeah, maybe it was like, you know, just some rando dude who was like, I curse you, but he was just playing with them all It's along. not the same. We know ghosts exist. So we all encountered a ghost in the summer of 1999. You remember oh. Akiyasu. <laughs> I guess. Hey, where's my tea? Brief moment where Yakako is like, I would kill ghosts for you, Koichi. And Koichi's all like, but but I'd be too scared. We have a healthy relationship now. Oh yeah, I guess I guess that's true. (laughs) (laughs) Just like Yukako's just there being like, yeah, we love each other. And Koichi is like, I guess we do. It's like, hmm. Yukako's mm. hair looks a lot less lively in this. I think maybe she's calmed down a bit. Uh, She's she's settled down. Not actively using her stand to make herself look stylish on the day-to-day anymore. Exactly. She's accepted that it's okay to be herself, (laughs) which is manipulative and terrifying. But hey, self-acceptance better than just being the worst, but even though still the worst. You know what? I can't really reconcile this, so... Rohan's narration yeah. takes us out. Uh, I never found out what happened to that man, but maybe next year I'll look into it. Huh. The man who spent the rest of his life being chased by vengeful ghosts. He's a bad person, but I respect him. I guess I'm the only one who could. Because <laughs> I am also a bad person. <laughs> Thus spoke Kishibe Rohan. God. Oh my God. So I didn't enjoy this one as much as the last one. Well, it's hard to overcome the the dizzying highs of the run. Literally, the run is one of the greatest pieces of media I've ever seen. So I, I've noticed it's interesting. They've paired um, in each of these two blocks of OVA releases, they've paired one um, that actively focuses on Rohan as the protagonist uh, with one where he is sort of a a si- side, more, more of a side character. Or like he's narrating or he's... Yeah. Yeah. just somewhere else yeah i think that's a good choice mm. no it's fun it's a good time i suppose also this this um this episode rohan telling this story would have coined the title thus spoke kashibe rohan oh, because he spoke and he told the yeah. story he told the story yeah <laughs> thusly but i want to see him go fishing <laughs> with tonio come on come on where's my happy fishing story <laughs> After part six, I guess. Oh, God damn it. Coming I guess it'll happen. 2024. 2024? I'm just making it up. Yeah, but that's actually a legitimate estimation. <laughs> oh my God. So Nick, what were our highlights this episode? My highlight would absolutely have to be uh, the... Uh, <laughs> I sounded so sure going into this. <laughs> Um, I guess I want to say it has to be like the the moment of the unveiling of oh, but I'm here again, right? Where the daughter is actually the spirit yeah. or the tongue, because at that point, by her. yeah, that's the bit I'm like, oh, oh yes, here we go. You know, I think my highlight is probably the um the second popcorn toss, the like <laughs> the so melodramatic reveal of the swooping doves, and then the equally melodramatic popcorn bag rip. Of just like, oh no, I need a way to deal with this incredibly stupid situation. (laughs) Oh, wait, I know. Let's get (laughs) stupider. Oh, so good. I do love the bit where it's all the doves just looking at him menacingly. Yeah, that was good. Because at that point, I really did think it's like a Merzbo album cover. (laughs) Because some of them are terrifying. Honourable mention to, I think, to seeing all our nice friends again. (laughs) Yeah. Good to see Okiyasu isn't, you know, unable to afford tea. Which is nice. Yep. Uh, also hilarious to see that Rohan refuses to acknowledge that man. That man. Ah, oh, that man. When will Josuke... I don't think Josuke ever has a full appearance in one of these Let's Work Kishibe Rohans. I wonder why. I want to say you see him from a distance in, in maybe Rohan at the Louvre or something. Okay. All right. That's hilarious. Just imagine it's like, so we all went to France. All of us, including that guy. <laughs> and that's the only mention of him. Oh man, what a lad. Yeah, no, I I always enjoy seeing how they're doing. Like in part four when Jotaro shows up and it's like, oh, he's doing marine biology now. 
oh, that's fun. Or like Joseph now has dementia. It's like, oh, that's, it's not fun. But at the same time, he's, he's getting along, you know, he's doing his thing. And, and and Koichi's brief appearance in part five aside, I think it makes sense that the way we are staying in touch with these characters is through just like these little, little uh, vignettes into their life. Because, because that's, that's part four, you know? Yeah. It's really, it's fun. It's a good time. Yeah. And of course, Rohan continues to engage in crazy bullshit because that's who he is. That's just how it's going to be. That is yeah. literally just how it's going to be. <laughs> um, Nick, low lights. Um, okay, so my low light would probably just have to be the mundanity of the popcorn fight. <laughs> really? Like, it's just... It's just so lame. Like, I get it. I get that it's like, I get that it's like, oh, you know, you were brought up with corn. You're eating popcorn. Bam. Look, I'll do something with corn. But it's still just like, you're you're flipping popcorn. But you're like a powerful ghost demon dude that could do literally anything. But challenge him to a shadow game. Yeah, but it's just a bit like, this is so mundane, you know? Like in the last one, the treadmill battle was like, it fed into that dude's obsession. And I was like, yeah. oh shit. But it, it was never, it was never about the treadmill, was it? You know? Whereas this <laughs> one was literally just, I need you to flick that popcorn up and have it come into your mouth. No, I think that actually was about the treadmill. <laughs> I mean, it was, but it like you know, <laughs> it had other layers, you know. Uh, whereas this one was just like it's it's flipping corn into your mouth. It could be anything else, just flipping into the air and catching in mouth. But it was corn. I was like, I That's think fine, my low like... light is probably just how unlikable he was in that introductory scene. Oh my fucking god, just he was just so bad, the worst. <laughs> like I know what they were going for, but he was, ugh, he was so he was so Iron Randy, so irritating. Do I make you Randy, baby? <laughs> <laughs> just the idea that someone could just be like, oh, look, there's a definitely homeless, jobless, and hungry man. Fucking work for it. It's just like, fuck off. <laughs> oh, hate it. Yeah. And that's why I hate the liberal government. Anyway. <laughs> oh, my God. That's right. We'll cut that out. It's fine. Um, so, Nick. Yes. Will we back to Castlevania Season 2 next week? Is that right? I think so. I think so. We haven't got any more... Well, we do have more JoJo's, but I think we'll probably do Castlevania we don't have, first. We don't have more JoJo's too? Oh, oh. oh the, the other OVAs, right. Yes. Exactly. What I was thinking, and I haven't run this by you and probably would be better doing it off air, but I uh-huh. was thinking we could probably treat those like we have with um, these two OVAs here as like a bit of a palette refresher between yeah. other seasons of things. Well, that's what I was thinking. We would do Season 2 and then come back to those OVAs. Mm-hmm. Do a couple of those. And then we come back to season three Castlevania. Yeah. Well, unless, of course, we get so hyped by the prospect of having new Castlevania, because, of course, we haven't watched that season yet. It's true. But it's still just like... We'll see how we feel. Yeah, I remember at the end of that season, I was like, that's a good spot to end it. <laughs> and if we had stuff in between two and three, I'd be perfectly content. Okay. Someone is making hot cross buns in this house. We must go. <laughs> Quickly. All right. Let's wrap this up. Goodbye. <laughs> oh. We might have a new theme song by now, courtesy to Milk Juice for that. Oh, I thank you. Thank you. Oh, hang on. No, of course we won't have the new we won't have the new theme song for this episode because this is a Mario episode, so I'll be using Jagrassi. Um thank but you, for thank next you. episode we may have a new theme song. Yeah. For La Castlevania. Hey, don't know why I just went Scottish. Anyway. Um yes. If you have enjoyed this content, you can support us on patreon.com slash Jojo's Podcast, right? Jojo's World. Jojo's World. Slash Jojo's World. That's the one. You'd think by now. I would remember it, given that I had to. <laughs> well, we're JoJo's podcast and everything else. It's true. So if you enjoy it, by all means, support us or just tell your friends. Just tell and them. And until then, to be, to be continued. continued.